Oh, my goodness, Kelly. Dana. You know, I really don't think we understand how fortunate we are to have the caliber of the music that we have. And I'm grateful. So, thank you, Diane, for facilitating it and band. All the do da day, y'all. Y'all's new name. The do da day band. <laughs> Woo! Don't get in front of us. You know, I begin to think about um, what normally we think about people going to talk about when Thanksgiving's coming up is we talk about Thanksgiving. And we usually wait once a year to talk about Thanksgiving. Um, but I began to think about it, and, and my first lesson, which is not the lesson I will give you, um, was about the little boy and five loaves and two fish. There are two places in the Word that it tells us this story. It's John chapter 6, for those of you taking notes, for those of you who just memorize everything. Uh, John chapter 6, verse 1 through 4, and then Mark chapter 6, starting with 37. What's interesting, with the four narratives of the life of Jesus, we get different stories. We get different elements of the stories. And in the Matthew version, uh, we don't see this particular aspect that, that struck me this morning. If you've been in Bible school, you've you know five loaves and two fish. We've done the stories, right? As adults coming up in the church, I knew the stories. Um, but God showed me later on that I had not read the Bible as an adult. I just remembered it as a child. And you read differently when you're older. You read differently when your eyes have seen pain. And you understand grief. And you understand your own folly. We read the Bible differently. And we speak about the dot. We, we speak about what we see in the word differently, I believe. And it's not a road map to good living. Um, it'd probably be better if we'd buy a magazine for that. Um, it is a road map to God. It is a road map to God so he will live through us and we will understand what resurrection life means. And it is in the word that we find that. Now, we have had people go before us. You had, I had my nanny. Uh, I had my mama. Uh, you had your mama probably back in the, the annals of your history. And, you know, I didn't really understand what happened when mama died was that I stepped up in her place. I took my place on the wall, I took my place as God had intended. And I was not the woman after Mama died that I was before. I began to grow up because I had a different role. Mom was gone. Mom was in heaven. But now I was the one to step up, and I was the one, hopefully, to lead others. Don't have children, so all my dogs are saved. And they're in heaven. I fully believe that. My mama Melrose has to take care of all of them. <laughs> but I think what we try to do is to ask God to put us in places where we talk about his life. But live the life. Um, you know, when I stand up in front of my students, when I stand up in front of first responders, uh, when I stand in front of a bed that has a, a daughter with leukemia who almost died last week. Um, I know that I am unworthy and unable to stand in that place, but he doesn't ask me to be. He asks me to stand in that place so he can be there. He stands there in my place. And sometimes it's just the ministry of presence. It's not what I say. Words crumble, words fade away, but God's presence lives forever. And those of you who support my ministry, I have a 501c3. I thank you for that because you enable me to do things free. 
I don't have to charge. I don't have to figure out how to do ministry. One of my first responders' daughter did almost die in St. Louis last week, and he called me. Well, he texted me on his way on Thursday night, not knowing if she would be alive when he got there. And I was sort of surprised. I, I was sort of surprised he texted and asked me to pray. So I happened to be at our prayer group, and I just asked us to pray. And so she did not die that night, and she was still in critical condition, just touch and go. And I felt like God allowed me, opened the door, gave me the idea to fly to St. Louis on Sunday morning and be with them. And then I flew back and got home Sunday night. And I appreciate the opportunity that we're able to go together to bring Jesus to possibly, I believe he knows the Lord, but I don't know about his daughter. We're hoping a young age dose of Jesus uh, was what she received, but I was able to stand and say, yes, I've come from Nashville to see you. Um, of course, I was in my uniform. I looked pretty good. Uh, uh, and uh, but what I see is God puts us in the situations like I saw Philip in, in Mark chapter 6 of this story. Because when all these 5,000 plus people are there, <laughs> Jesus asks Philip, you know, he like points him out and he, he looks at him and it's words in red. Jesus said it to him and he said, where are we to buy bread that these may eat? And, he, you know, he wasn't whispering. So here's Philip. All the disciples are looking. All the entourage is looking. As many as 5,000 could hear, they're all looking because they are hungry. And here's Philip. Um, well, you know, it would take more than a full day's wage to feed these people. And... Somewhere in there, Peter pipes up and he says, hey, I'll help. I got five loaves and two fish from this little boy. <laughs> Can you see all of the disciples like, what? Well, way to go, Peter. Way to find the big lunch. <laughs> all the while, the bread of life is standing in their presence. But see, that's what I want to communicate today. We have to understand who Jesus is. We have to understand who we are in him, how we got there, and how we function. When I'll go on forward with a little bit of lesson. What, what, the next verse after Jesus asked Philip in verse 6, Jesus, it, it goes on and says, let's see, where is it? Um thought I wrote it down. Oh, verse 6 says, For this Jesus was saying to test Philip, for he himself knew what he was intending to do. So he asked Philip, where can we get bread to feed all these people? And then we see John. John's always explaining. He's always making sure we understand the situation. But he says he's only testing him because he already knows what he intends to do. Right, verse 6. So the, the deal here is I put myself in that situation. And I'm like, well, why did you ask me if you already knew? Because I just went through a thousand deaths and a thousand moments of humiliation because I didn't have any idea how we, we were going to get bread. Most of the time when you're with a group and they go, how are we going to get out of this? They're looking straight at you, aren't they? The we ain't there. You're like, who's we? You looking at me. We. And, and what I, I got real comfort in that is that a lot of times what the Lord leads me to, and I think I'm responsible to come up with the answer or the way, I need to remember he already knows what he intends to do. So this moment must be a moment for my faith. 
And for me to stand firm and say, I want you to know I believe that God is in charge. That is what we offer the world. We can give money. We can, you know, do a pom-pom. We can buy little kids presents at Christmas. You, you know, we can support the school in, in Malawi. Um, we can do many things God wants us to do. But we need to back up and remember, it's not my money that does that. I did not earn that money without the blessing of God. I don't have that money unless he has allowed me to keep it. I need to go back to him. So when I was thinking about Thanksgiving, I bet Philip was real thankful after that when Jesus said, well, let me have that lunch, Peter. And he, I don't even know how it worked. You know, he kept breaking the bread and, and passing it out. And I wrote a little song a long time ago about it. Uh, I had a really creative title, Five Loaves and Two Fish. Um, and the bridge, the last part of the bridge says, um, I think it says, it's been a long time, Lord, please, just like you broke the bread to feed the 5,000, I pray, Lord, that you would break me and pass me out to the ones who need to know your love, the ones starving to know thee. See, there's no giving out before there's breaking. There's no breaking before there's yielding. And I think in my life sometimes I just want the pain to stop. You know, I, I just want the pain to stop. Mm -mm. And what I see that what God took me for Thanksgiving, because in my life, all the years of Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving Day was not a day of Thanksgiving. It was awful. Uh, my dad's mama always messed up somehow. She was coming, and my dad wanted her to come, and she'd call like before that morning or the night before and say, Jimmy, I don't think I'm coming. And he would go into this thing, oh, yes, you are, mama, I'll come up and get you. And we're all wor running around for this lady in Silicaga that we would just wish would stay right there. And I have said many times, and I'll say it again, the best thing she ever did for my daddy and us was die. Now, we need to ponder that for a moment. Because this life can make us bitter. Pain can make us ugly and mean. Unfulfilled dreams make us cranky. And take it out on other people. When in fact the beef we have is with God. Go to him. How do I give thanks? First point, Dr. Luke. How do I give thanks? I ask God to reveal me my sin. This sermon is not about thanksgiving. It's about sin. I realized when God brought this to mind that I had not heard the word sin, and I don't know when. I used to hear, hear it multiple times, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, training union, any other situation we came in. We Baptists focused a lot on sin, usually others' sin. <laughs> Those people's sin. And we, for the most part, I didn't see a rejoicing in understanding we were forgiven. But that we had to constantly go to the Lord and ask, just restore my relationship with you. Because I thought it was something that we did about every six months when the pastor would say, if anyone wants to rededicate their life to the Lord and come down here, we will pray for that person. And, we, you know, like, yeah, because you got all that Six months of sin built up, right? So your heart's beating. You're like, yeah, yeah, I haven't asked forgiveness. I need to go down there and talk to the pastor. Well, my pastor was my dad, and I was not going to go down. <laughs> no, I wasn't telling anything to him. But I did. I would go down, and the whole congregation, y'all Baptists, y'all been here? The whole congregation would come by and shake your hand. Basically, you're, you were saying, I'm a sinner and I need forgiveness. Well, we're just with you. 
you little sweetheart. You know, it, it was just weird. And when I began to grow in the Lord and began to get in the Word, I did not know until then that I could just all the time talk to Jesus and ask him to be with me. I just didn't know that. We didn't know that. We weren't privy to that because we needed to do the six-month rededicate our life thing because I think they could count that for the denomination. I'm not sure. I know we did baptism. You know, you have, did y'all have a little old thermometer out in front of your church that you kept painting so everybody could see how many people had come to God and been baptized in your church? It was a competition. We weren't going to get, we weren't going to lose the thermometer thing. So we brought everybody in, right? We bought buses. We stuffed them in. We get little things. Check the box, okay? Check the box. So they check the box. Hey, one more thing. We're up here. One more thing. We missed the point. The point is, is I'm a sinner. And God knows that. And he wants me to come to him. And I started thinking, you know what? What does sin mean? What, what does sin mean? And this morning in Oswald Chambers, um, he was writing about sin. And I began to think, well, what does sin mean? How, what is the definition of sin? And I did what our kids do today. I Googled it. <laughs> I Googled sin. Okay. And this is what it comes up to be. The Oxford Dictionary, dictionary, which comes first, defines sin as a noun, as an immoral act, considered to be a transgression against divine law. As a verb, it defines sin as in commit a sin. Now, Merriam-Webster defines sin as first an offense against religious or moral law. Do you see the absence of something important in that def definition? God. Moral law. The second definition of sin is an action that is or is felt to be highly reprehensible. And the sentence, you ever see, ever watch uh, the spelling bee on television? They'll give them a word and they'll go, could you use that in a sentence? That's what they say if you haven't gone. You really need to look at that. It says, it is a sin to waste food. That's the, that's the sentence that they use to define sin on the first one. You know, they always give one, two, and three. So I kept going down. It says, it is a vitiated state of human nature. I had to look that up. Which means to impair the quality of or make faulty or spoil. It is a spoiled state of human nature in which the self is estranged from God. I had to go to the second definition to find God. And then it goes down to say, the sin is to impair or weaken effectiveness. Aren't you glad you came here so we could go through the definitions of sin? If we don't even know what sin is, it's very difficult to ask forgiveness for it. And I think in my life, we didn't, we didn't like divide it up and talk about sin. It was sin. So you didn't think about how you yelled at your wife. You didn't think about how you abused your child. You didn't think about how you cussed in the car. You didn't think about how you don't have a good attitude for the most time. Because that's just the way I am. We didn't go through and talk about the things that were not godly. We talked about sin. It's a lot easier to confess sin than to confess I was ugly to John. And then go to John if God moves my heart to say, John, will you forgive me for being ugly to you? Are you kidding? It's just better to say, I rededicated my life. Because I don't want to go to somebody and say, I'm sorry. Not just I'm sorry, but will you forgive me? Why? Because God has forgiven me and he's directed me to do the same. What shows God? Mercy? Yeah. But I read a definition and it said, God forgives sin because God is love. Oswald Chambers blows that out of the water. He said, no, 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 no. God forgives sin because it is a, a, a heinous, 
I forget what he said. He, he just said, sin is the reason Jesus had to die. So every time he forgives my individual sins, it's because Jesus died. So I never thought that every time I come to God and ask for forgiveness, I don't know how God does this or if it happens, but I'm a fiction writer, so go with me. Every time I go to God and I ask him to forgive me of my sin, instead of him being, you know, like, yes, how wonderful. The first thing is, is Jesus blood has to be applied to that sin he has to look at me through jesus's blood and then i experience god's love but not in the initial thing it took jesus's death to die i wrote a a, a hymn to, to try to get in a a new hymn a long long time ago it didn't make it but i talked about blood and they said roseanne we don't talk about blood anymore well what do y'all talk about the love of God. Ergo, your, your hymn is not going to make it in our book. Because I talked about the blood of Jesus cleanses me and invites me into his presence. That's the only way I can get there. But you know what? We don't stay in that. We ask forgiveness and then we are like Peter. We see God work. Does that make sense? When God moves our hearts and says, you know what, that probably wasn't a good thing to do. Then we need to act on it and say, you know what, Father, you let me ask forgiveness. Let me see verses. And then we accept that we are forgiven and we move forward. A lot of us don't want to talk about what we've done wrong because we have so much of a pile. It would take years, we think, to get through it. Does that make sense? It's like, I can't stop now. I mean, I can't start doing that now. I have a dump truck full of stuff I'd have to wade through in order to get to that glorious moment of forgiveness. And Jesus says, no, I will lead you. What does David said when he, he lies with Bathsheba? The baby's born. And then he is, he is forced to look at what his sin is. Do you know what he says? Lord, against you and you only have I sinned. Well, let's talk to Uriah. <laughs> he had Uriah killed so he would be free and clear that that baby would be, you know, it'd be Uriah's and not his and he'd have Bathsheba. No, Lord, the Lord circumvented that. He didn't let it happen. Why? Because he didn't want a liar and a cheat and a sinner on the throne because David's heart was after God. And if my heart is after God, I've got to periodically look and see. Am I, am I understanding that this is not coming to church, giving my money, bringing pies, which we're real grateful for that. But it's not that. It is a part of that. That is coming out of that. But the main thing is, is when I repent, then I can be thankful. When I repent, then I can be thankful. See, when Philip stood and the crowd was looking at him, I understand that. When I'm standing in front of my kids and they're all upset with me because I do not approve of what they did because they did not follow my instructions and I will not give them a good grade because they did not follow my instructions. Even though their essays are really nice, they did not follow my instructions. And so therefore they're going to get an F and they are not happy. To which they respond, Dr. C, you know, many of us may have messed up on this fourth essay because of the teachers we've had in the past and what they taught and how they taught us to do this. Do you see this face, I say? It's the same one who's been up here three times a week since August saying, this is the formula. Follow it and you will live. Right? And so when I said, what kind of excuse is that? And they're like, well, you know, we just wanted you to know. I said, well, thanks. That is absolutely disappointing and disgusting. They're just like, she is just something wrong with her. She's in a bad mood. Uh-huh. Now, if I, as an English teacher can stand there and realize that my kids did not follow my plan and therefore they had a bad essay, I can have a little bit of moment with God. 
God, I didn't follow your plan. Well, no duh, Roseanne. <laughs> God, I just followed what I used to do. No duh, Roseanne. You're not who you used to be. That is not your savior. That is not your forgiveness. That is not your life. That is not who you will face when you close your eyes in death and open your eyes in heaven. He's not going to say, you did a good job with those kids on those essays. That's not what he's going to say. He's going to hopefully say, well done, my good and faithful servant for all of it in the fact that I stayed close. I asked forgiveness. I walked in forgiveness. And then therefore I could be thankful. In my household, my dad was a preacher. No holiday did we stop to talk about the Lord. We didn't pass around. You know, I've heard people, they say, well, in our house, we passed around an ear of corn. Not cooked, you know, the hard kind. We passed around the ear of corn, and whoever got it, they were supposed to tell something they were thankful for. In my house, we would have been mute. Thankful for the frozen corn. Thanks, Mom. Mama didn't like to cook, but we liked her frozen corn. <laughs> it's what we had every year. We were hoping for it. I remember one year, Dad wanted us to go to another little city out of Pensacola to have the Thanksgiving lunch that they said, and they, they had different groups of people coming in. And I was thinking about that this morning, and I thought, I wonder what that said to Mama when he said, I'm really tired of your food, let's go out. That's probably what he said. But he said it like this. Hey, wouldn't it be fun after the girls have driven 10 hours to get in the car and go over four more hours and have lunch with a bunch of strangers? And, and mama, mama didn't. Mm -mm, that wasn't mama. She liked to fix the frozen corn because she liked to have the girls around the table in her home. Oh, Father. Help us remember, what does it mean? What does it mean to be forgiven? I've got some scriptures for you, those of you who want to write them down. If you don't, I think we record this, and you can go back and stop me and start me. <laughs> I think that's kind of funny. Um, let's see, where are those? Colossians 3.13. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Isaiah 55, 7. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them and to our God for he will freely pardon. Let me interject this. When I was uh, working on my doctorate, at MTSU, there was a, a professor there who believed in aliens and had witches come and speak to her classes, but I couldn't talk about Jesus. Okay. And we were about the same height. And so one day she came stomping up to me. I'd been working in my, my room, in my office since 6 a.m. And she came storming up to me, and, and, and she's so mad, she's spitting in my face. And she's like, how do you Christians come off doing this? I have no idea what you're talking about. Haven't I been nice to you? <laughs> you know, like, I think I've been nice to you. You're not very nice to me. But And what happened was uh, an abortion doctor had been shot. And I said, I, I totally agree with you. That's sinful. That's against God. I, that's what I believe. I believe that's what the Bible says. And, and she didn't know what to do with that because I didn't side with the other people. So she had all this fury pent up and just didn't know where to go with it. And so she, she went down this direction. So do you call me a sinner? We're just having a great conversation. You want to get some coffee? Um, maybe get out of this hallway that you're right in my face. And... Um, I said, well, I, I'm not here to call you anything. I know I've done wrong. I, I know I need forgiveness, not only with God, but other people. So, no, ma'am, I'm not calling you uh, a sinner. 
Now, if you read the Bible, you may find in there someone else does, but I don't. That, that didn't go over too well. But see, what we need to realize is nobody wants to be wrong. Now, if you don't believe me, just get in your car and blow your horn at somebody in traffic. <laughs> oh, my goodness gracious. They wrecked their cars trying to tell you how pitiful you are. And they didn't do anything wrong. And actually, you're the one who's wrong. And let's pull over here and we'll duke it out. I just was saying, turn on your blinker. No, we, we don't like to be said. How about in your families, ladies and gentlemen, husbands and wives? How, did, how have you worked out through all these years of how you tell each other that you're sorry? Forgive me. Or you just don't do it anymore. My household, the silence was awful because only one person was ever right. When only one person's right, nobody else can speak. There's no way to have a, a back and forth. There's no way to know the cleansing freedom of forgiveness and grace and mercy. And we're all sinners. You don't have that. So as we talk about the time that is to come, we need to remember the Lord has said he will forgive us. Jesus on the cross, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Proverbs 28, 13, whoever conceals their sin does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them, renounces them finds mercy. Psalm 32, 5, this is before Jesus even came. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. I want to stay there just for a moment. I think that's the hardest part about sin and asking forgiveness is letting go of the guilt. Is, is that a possibility? I really think my dad might have been free to ask forgiveness for a lot of the stuff he did if he didn't go directly to how hard it would be to, to handle that guilt of my knowing he knew he had wronged me. Does that make sense? So... In my life, I've had to work really hard to realize I'm wrong. I don't come to a relationship like a board meeting and have all my notes together. And when I come to you and talk to you about something, I'm going to, okay, on page six, let's talk about what I did. You know, I didn't know how you did it. I never saw it worked out. I never saw it lived out. I didn't know how to do it. So guess what? After mama died, I decided I was going to find out. So I went to counseling and I began to work on it. And finally, I had the courage to say to my dad, you know, I did, I'm not going there. I'm not going to participate in that. And I thought, what is he going to do, kill me? If he kills me, I'm with Mama. And Sherry's left with him. <laughs> I mean, we start looking at what the possibilities are. But then he, I realized he was a bully. If I had been able to stand up to him earlier... I would have had peace. He would have had peace because I would have said, no, sir, not going to work anymore. I'm not six years old. I'm an adult. I, I, I've been living on my own. Why don't we live like Jesus says we can live, Daddy? Why can't we live what Jesus said through the scripture that you've preached all these years? My dad, I hope, is in heaven. I, I just don't know. But I think if we realize what we say and what we do really needs to matter. So what I want to do today is to speak forgiveness to you. You've already been forgiven. Jesus died on the cross that we would be forgiven. He saw the sin we'll commit right before we die to the nth degree. And he said, for that sin I die. It's already been paid for. There is not a debt I can pay. There is not something that God looks at me and says, ooh. We can't forgive that one. I never knew you were going to do that. No, it's already been. He's God. He's already seen to the end. And yet in that space, he says, and I offer you forgiveness if you will confess your sin. Recognize you need me, Roseanne. Isn't that the point? How wonderful. I need the living God who is the living God. Google does not mention 
the living God. No definition can contain who he is or what he wants to do through us. And you know what? Sometimes I think my life has not been worth very much or when I stand up in front of those kids and go oh my gosh if we have to do this one more time you know I'm grading essays I'm in the middle of grading essays now they come for conferences and I'm I'm looking at them on zoom and I'm like okay tell me how you got there yeah Do you understand that doesn't make any sense? <laughs> okay, where does that fit in the formula? Ooh, I forgot the formula. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's hard, isn't it? When you don't see the fruit of your labor, but yet you still keep throwing the seed out, you still keep believing that kid's going to have something that one day he's going to say. I don't remember her name, but there was this lady who told me she believed in me, even though I never did what she said I was supposed to do. I didn't fail. I passed. I don't know how. But I, I, I'm grateful that one day she looked at me, and I try to do this with every kid. I say, I believe in you. I believe in you. This grade is not who you are, even if it's an A. You will change the world. Your eyes will see things that mine will never see because they'll already be closed in death. But I charge you with the responsibility to change this world. You can. They don't know what to do with me. They're like, she's preaching again, I guess. But periodically I do that. I have the platform. I don't know that anybody else in their lives stands up in front of them and says, I believe in you. You're going to change this world. You have to do it. Quit messing around. <laughs> because God has forgiven me. Because God let me, he lets me be in that place. Kids ask me, what are you going to do for Thanksgiving, Dr. C? I said, there's this family who's adopted me. And they let me be an extra grandmother. And this is their faces. Oh, that's just so nice. That's so sweet of those people. That was to the person. That was so sweet of those people. I'm like, yeah, it is. I am not the prize turkey. I, I, you know, <laughs> I'm not the funnest thing at the, at the table. But I'm grateful they let me in. And they laugh. And I say, it's good to laugh, isn't it? It's good to remember that people love us. And if we, they don't, you be the one who loves. And they're funny because they're like, okay. So when we talk about Thanksgiving, we must talk about sin. When we talk about sin, we must understand forgiveness. And when we understand forgiveness, we give thanks. In that order. Let's pray. Lord, uh, thank you. I, I don't, I, I, sometimes it's hard to believe you're real. Sometimes it's hard to believe you're here. Sometimes it's hard to believe that in this space there are myriads of angels. Your presence is here through the Holy Spirit that you have the power of the living God. Sometimes it's just hard for me to put words to that, that my heart believes it. But I say as that father did, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Thank you that I don't have to say that often because I have seen you in my life. May I continue to live each moment. I don't wait six months to ask forgiveness that I come to you multiple times in the day when, Holy Spirit, you prompt me. And I ask today, Father, you make us sensitive to your spirit. Make us sensitive to the spirit who whispers, you need to confess that sin. That is sin. That is not just wrong. That's a sin, not just against that person, but against God. Quickly confess so there will be times of refreshing. 
Thank you, Lord, that was your way. If my family had been charged of this thing, nobody would have had a good time after they asked forgiveness. We just didn't know how to forgive. We didn't know how to give grace. We didn't know how to give mercy. But thank you that that does not thwart you, and it does not stop you from showing me what those things mean and helping me give those things out to others. Thank you, Father, that you can open our hearts and have the people in here who have never believed they're important, never believed that they're worthy, never believed that they're lovable. You can open our hearts and let us know that. I pray that right now. Break through our shells of hardness, of loneliness, of difficulty, and, and help us stand in that place like I felt when Mama died, to step up in that place and to stand firm in you. Not that I don't get weary, not that I don't get discouraged, but then I have to realize I'm standing behind you. I'm not standing there myself. I followed you to that because I'm your sheep and I follow your voice and you lead me and guide me. And it says you go before me and behind me and cover me with your hand. Help me, Father, live more in that than in isolation to protect my sinful nature. Father, thank you. You thought of the change in business. Thank you, Jesus, that you said you would die for unrepentant people who might believe one day they can repent, be cleansed, be saved, and be changed. May we be those people. Thank you. It's not on us, it's on you. And Jesus, you've already done it. May we revel in that this Thanksgiving. When we go to our homes that maybe are not too fun, may we be the life and the light because you are there. Let us not be afraid. Let us not be angry. Let us not stand on years and years and years of bad things. But may we move forward in light and life and breath and forgiveness, and gratefulness, and thanksgiving. Father, thank you for this food. Thank you that you have blessed it. Thank you that you let the things that go in our bodies nourish us. And may we go forth from that, knowing we are from you. And I ask all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen.